Okay, uh, thank you, Ray, for uh, for starting us off with that, and uh, we'll continue a bit on the uh, K unit theme uh, for the next twenty five minutes or so, uh, with the slightly interestingly named uh, testing drivers with K unit, which I picked because I wanted the second line rather than because it's a perfect description of of what we'll be talking about. Um, I am uh, David, and I'm the the K unit maintainer. Um, so let's let's get started um, if this uh, this works. Okay, the what is K unit? This is exactly the same slide that Ray just showed you all. Um, uh, for the people who uh, have just come into the room or are you know looking online, you probably already have a pretty good idea if you're looking up testing talks. But uh, K unit is is still a unit testing framework for the Linux kernel since 5.5. Um, basically, uh, you know, you write tests in the kernel and they run. Um, if you want to know more, either watch the previous talk or uh, pause and, and Google it if you're watching a recording. Uh, and similarly, there are several features um, which we've added relatively recently or are relatively interesting. Um, the ability to add sort of resources that automatically get cleaned up, which has existed for a while, but we've improved recently with uh, the defer uh, K unit add action functions and similar. Our parameterized testing lets you run the same test code with multiple sets of input data. Um, we have the ability to redirect function calls, which I talked about here last year, and some nice tooling features to run tests on different architectures in QEMU and with different config options. There's a website with lists, you know, there's documentation in the kernel. Um, you can search for things. I won't spend too much time on that. What I want to talk about now is the fact that some code's easy to test and some code isn't. Um, and as the title alluded to, spoilers, drivers are one of the difficult to test things. Um, so what code is easy to test? Basically, it's library code. Um, you know, stuff that is uh, really self-contained. So things like data structures and algorithms, um, you know, we've got good tests for the kernel linked list implementation. Um, we've got tests for hashes and hash tables. There are tests for crypto um, algorithms. These are all pretty self-contained, you know, you can spin up a linked list in a test, you can try adding things, removing things. You're not interacting with anything big and global that was going to cause problems. Um, similarly, helper functions. Um, the example I like to use here is we've got quite a lot of tests for things that convert timestamps to one format to another. Most of the, the different file system tests we've got, the first thing anyone tests in a file system is can you read the weird uh, timestamp format that particular file system uses and convert it to a standard Unix timestamp. Um, equally, you know, converting from Unix time to civil time um, is well tested. Um, but these functions are, are very sort of self-contained as well. They, they take an input, they produce an output. They're not, you know, they might read a little bit from global state, but they don't do very much. Um, don't, don't fiddle around with anything deep in the kernel. Uh, parsers can get a little bit more complicated, but as anyone who's tried any form of uh, string manipulation or other sort of data file manipulation in C, you know, it's something you really want to test. Uh, and again, it's taking an input uh, and producing an output, a parsed form of, of this code for the most part. And basically what this is saying is anything which in the sort of computer science sense is a pure function or has no side effects is easy to test. You've, you've got, you know, you can just write something that takes a particular input, calls the function, checks the output as what is expected. Um, that's much nicer than something that, you know, takes some input, takes some random state from your machine, does something, mutates all of the other bits of machine state, and then you've got to go all the way through the kernel first, finding everything and then cleaning it up. Um, and the other area which can help is code that has really explicit abstractions. Um, 
if you know your code is is very uh, modular and you can pull different bits out and replace things with fake versions, that makes it a lot easier to test code. Um, if it's layered, that can help. You know, you've got a layer which is a sort of user layer. You've got a hardware layer underneath. If you can easily get in between those layers and inject things, uh, that makes testing that code much easier, particularly from a, a unit test point of view. You know, you can do big functionality tests that pull everything in, but if you want to test individual chunks of code, they really need to be sort of self-contained in some way, or at least the the interfaces around them need to be really explicit. So if that's the best case, what's what's the worst case? And the, the bad news is a lot of the kernel is the answer. Um, basically global state in whatever form your global state is. Uh, and that's not just global variables, even though we do love global variables in the kernel, or static variables, which are like global variables, but you can't tell quite as easily. Um, it's things like, you know, anything two systems which are coupled tightly together. Um, you know, not having that strong interface in between them uh, makes it very difficult to isolate just one of them to test. Um, the other sort of secret bit of global state is hardware state is global state. You know, if you tweak some hardware register, you can't exactly easily intercept that. You know, that that's going to stay there. It's not a separate piece of hardware just for the test. There's real hardware there. So you don't want in your unit tests to be prodding real hardware if you can avoid it. And particularly, you know, I think some of the newer GPUs might have things where you can spin up, you know, special test contexts or whatever. But for most hardware, you've got one register and you need it to be able to, to boot your kernel. You don't want to be playing around with it just for a test. Uh, the other pattern we have a lot of in the kernel are big global lists of things. Um, you know, if you want to create a device because you're testing a driver, you have to register it in a big global list of devices. Um, file systems, there's big global lists of registered file systems and the like. This basically means anything that deals with a file system or a driver or that is by necessity dealing with that global state. Um, and that's a bit of a pain. Um, I don't think it's a pain we can totally get rid of, but it's um, one of those areas that, that sort of limits the ability to just, I wanna grab a function and test this. Um, and finally, there's a bunch of other just implicit global state that we don't think about, you know, um, memory allocations, you know, we've got one global allocator everyone's using. So by necessity, if you're testing things, uh, there are more side effects than you'd expect. Um, so why do we care so much about global state in tests? Um, and there are three reasons, basically. Uh, with a test, we really need to know what the starting state of something we're investigating is. Um, you know, you can't just, if you've got, for instance, a function that that adds one to a number and you're testing that it does that successfully, you need to know what the number starts with so that you can check that the result is correct. Um, we need to be able to mutate state uh, without breaking everything. You know, um, It's no good if we decide we're just going to test something that totally wipes all of the page tables because the test's not going to complete because once the test's over, you've, you've got no access to the rest of the kernel. Um, so it's it's very difficult to mutate state safely um, if you're working on a, a real system, which you know in K unit we are. It's running within the real kernel, uh, and you need to make sure if you're modifying something within a test, some other part of the kernel's not also modifying that in the background because it needs to to keep the system running. Um, and this is a pain because none of those things are true. <laughs> Um, in the kernel. We always are starting in weird unknown states with, you know, uh, either uninitialized memory or, you know, other drivers have booted and there's already a big list of registered file systems that we now need to slot on the new one we're testing into. Um, maybe the one we're testing is already uh, registered and already reading files off it if we start a test after boot. Um, you know, we're mutating state all of the time. Um, you know, 
all of these other parts of the kernel are modifying things. The kernel's running as a real system. Um, and we can't just, as much as we'd like to, decide we're going to put a big lock around everything and say, well, while tests running, nothing can change because, you know, if you did, you'd, you'd hit deadlocks immediately. You wouldn't be able to use the system while a test's running. You know, it's a pain. Uh, and finally, tests fail all the time. You know, as much as we like to imagine tests are perfect things, testing imperfect systems, tests are themselves very imperfect things. Um, you know, they can fail, they can leak memory, you know, they can put things in a bad state and never restore them. And while good tests shouldn't, um, it's difficult to rely on, on things working. That's why, you know, K-unit tests and most other tests now taint the kernel when they're run because, frankly, code that's supposed to put things in a weird state and then eventually fix it if the test succeeds correctly is not something you want running on your big production system. So it's a pretty nasty state of the world if you're testing something more complicated than everyone's favorite helper add one function. Um, so what can we do as authors of tests? Um, the first one and the least pleasant, or perhaps the most pleasant, depending on how you think about it, is design your code or refactor your code with this in mind. Minimize global state or at least keep global state somewhere where you can avoid it um, if you need to. Um, you know, if you can't get rid of global state, and you can't always, hardware is global state and a kernel would be pretty useless if it couldn't talk to hardware, um, try wrapping it in something that you can then intercept um, from your test and replace with a fake. Um, make good use of pure functions where you can, you know. Uh, it's generally considered good practice now to, if a function doesn't need to have side effects, not give it side effects. Um, and while we don't always do this um, in the kernel, and while the definition of side effect, you know, can be uh, can be interesting in the kernel, um, you know, if we can move these things to you know independent functions, that helps. With, with basically the goal of swapping fake clients and devices and processes and user memory context and that in so that we can operate on fake safe things where we can rather than having to operate on real state and clean it up and hope nothing else touches it in the meantime. And also when writing things, trying as best we can to have really clean API surfaces, even internally to a driver or subsystem. You know, if your driver is made up of several logical bits, you're you know dealing with a, a complicated device that has several different components. You know, try to have clean API boundaries around that. Even if you don't decide you're very explicitly going to maintain those as you know a stable API, you know it's good to have you know, these surfaces where you can reach in and, and sort of split things apart so they don't become so coupled together, you can't test them in isolation. So this is all well and good. Please, everyone, do this when you write your next subsystem from scratch. It's a bit difficult to do so with an existing um, driver or that. It involves a lot of refactoring. Um, Refactoring is unpleasant, particularly if you're doing it before you write the test, so that it's easier to write the tests rather than afterwards so you can check that it works. And there can be cases where, you know, splitting things apart, you know, things were written together for a reason. You know, there are advantages to coupling and, and global state and that. It makes things simpler. It can be more performant in some cases. You know, this is not a be-all, end-all, always do this, but, you know, keeping this in mind is, is useful. If you can't, there are progressively more and more hacky ways to, to sort of force the issue. Um, the function redirection feature we've recently added, or static stub, uh, as it's also called, basically lets us you know, annotate a function saying we want to be able to replace this at runtime, um, and then within a test, replace calls for that function to a, a fake or test-specific equivalent. Um, there are a few things using this now. Um, I know the ext4 MB alloc tests that have just uh, just landed do this. Um, it's pretty pretty basic under the hood. Basically, just inserts an if a test is running, return fake function else real function thing there. But it uses you know uh, all sorts of things to make this performant and not as ugly as it sounds. Um, 
Uh, this, this is pretty good. You know, it's actually not a bad way of inserting these surf, you know, API surfaces in where it otherwise would be a little bit trickier to do so, particularly into existing code. Um, but at the same time, it's you know, not as ideal as working on a perfectly architected, uh, theoretically perfect system. Um, there are some things like you really don't want to be suddenly replacing all calls to kmalloc within your test. Um, that's going to lead down a very unpleasant path for you if you try, as the tests themselves and the ability to redirect things call kmalloc. Um, uh, if you need to, you know, export functions uh, somewhere deep in the call stack so that your test module can access them, that's unpleasant. Um, Multi-threaded tests are something that exist but are not well supported at the moment. Um, if people want to, you know, uh, really have something to cry about, we can talk about those later. But the KUnit framework really assumes your test lives in a single thread. And if you want to do something else, you've really got to work hard for it. Um, the other thing, devices and, and drivers. Um, this is sort of the struct device and, and struct device driver. A lot of driver code really needs this struct device point or a registered device somewhere to work. Um, and it's not really practical uh, to say, OK, let's go to every single device and every single driver and split it into a part that doesn't need this and a part that does and only test the part that doesn't. Um, people have been testing devices, drivers uh, with, uh, with KUnit for a while. And the way we've all done it is basically by using root device register to create a root device. And because that's literally the easiest way to get a struct device, even if it's not sort of the right way to get a struct device. Um, and, you know, it's worked well. People have done it. The, the tests will pass. Um, uh, but, you know, as we've expanded that, uh, talking to uh, Greg in particular, um, you know, everyone's going, hang on, this is, this is really wrong. This is not a root device in a hierarchy. This is just a, a fake device. Um, platform devices have also worked. I know DRMs had some success with this. Um, but you still need a bus of some kind to attach it to. And my preferred way of pretending you're on an ancient ISA uh, machine and attaching everything to the ISA bus is uh, a great joke, but not a great production answer to the problem. Um, so we need a way to do that. Um, one possibility uh, is KUnit integration into device tree. Um, Stephen Boyd sent out some early uh, patches on that, which work but have not yet um, landed, um, which involves having a magic Linux KUnit board that you use with device tree. Um, we're working out how best to handle that with device tree overlays and the like. Um, I think that's going to be a part of the solution going forward. Um, but not everyone's using device tree for testing, particularly if you've got, you know, x86 specific devices or that where device tree is not as common. Um, the answer, and there's an old RFC out there and there's going to be um, a new one as soon as I find the time to send it out, um, is struct K unit device, which, um, is basically a device structure that's KUnit specific. There is a KUnit specific bus it attaches to and a bunch of helper functions that nicely clean these up when your test exits, whether it passes or fails. Um, it also can magically spin up a driver if you need a driver attached that again is just a stub um, with you know, the name of your test. Uh, so that's sort of the state of things. Uh, and we've got a few forward-looking possibilities, again, to help try to solve these that I'd be very curious uh, to hear people's thoughts on. Uh, one is Logic IOMM, which if you haven't heard of, is a feature used by the Vertio PCI support in UML. Um, it basically is a fake implementation of IO memory accesses, where accesses to IOMM are redirected to function calls. Um, Something like this could be really useful for mocking out hardware at a low level um, and, you know, would obviate the need for people in tests to have lots of, you know, write to my register functions that are then redirected. Um, but it's very UML specific. Um, 
and porting it to non-UML architectures sounds like it could be really interesting um, and tricky. Um, if so, we need to actually work out when we're trying to talk to real hardware, when we're trying to talk to fake hardware, and we don't want to do this in a way that totally kills performance uh, on real hardware. So is that interesting? Is it not? We're not yet sure. Um, we haven't played with porting it to non-UML, but I know Brendan has played a little bit with putting helpers around that to make uh, faking registers really easy in the past. Um, it also breaks everyone's current fallback approach of pretend real memory is IO memory, just malloc something or that and, you know, cast it to an IO mem pointer and look at what the result is after a function is being called, um, which doesn't work on UML, but does work on everything else. Um, another possibility is uh, variable redirection or static data stubbing. This is just an extension to the redirect function calls to redirect you know, a variable where instead of accessing a variable directly through some horrific macros, you um, access a pointer to a variable and that pointer's value depends on whether a test is running or not. Um, we've tried it, but um, generally thus far, it's not seen sort of enough excitement and enough use. We really want to push it unless more people want it because it's ugly. Um, but could be interesting. I know um, there were some people looking at this for testing, you know, global process lists and the like. Um, maybe we only have uh, 10 minutes to go, so maybe uh, call for questions and if anyone wants I to. I will we'll do so. This is, I think, the last slide. Right. So um, the other thing then is... Um, the user context slash MM context, basically people want to be able to do copy to from user um, within a test. To do that, you need some sort of memory context. It's tricky to spin one of those up entirely within the kernel without you know, there actually being a real associated user space process. There have been some prototypes on this, but it, it could be an interesting topic to discuss if, if people are interested. Or something else. So. Let's uh, have a discussion. So uh, one of the big problems, of course, is emulating hardware. So <clears throat> what about uh, some dynamic connection to QEMU? So you're doing is out the emulation outside the hard outside the kernel. So I know there was someone looking at this um, with a bunch of QEMU patches. It wasn't, you know, a, a K unit based implementation, but um, I think there there have been people playing with with this in the past. Um, it's difficult for us to totally integrate this into K unit specifically because K units very much an entirely in kernel thing. We'd need some sort of back channel to to do that, but it's you know interesting and worth thinking about more. Um. Regarding the hardware testing angle, mm. is there any consideration of partitioning hardware and having some things run tests and some things not? So for example, let's say you have a test case that is handled within a single logical CPU end to end. Mm. Could we reserve that logical CPU, run the test on it so it doesn't have side effects or minimal side effects to the rest of the system, but is actually running on real hardware? Um, I think such a thing could happen. You lose the advantage if the hardware is specific enough that fake hardware gives you of you don't actually need real hardware to, to test it. Um, but, you know, I think for some hardware, something like that could work. I don't think it's, you know, going to work for every different piece of hardware. You know, there are some things which there can only be one of, but, um, right. you know, GPU contexts, I think you can spin up as many as you like within a uh, thing that might work. Um, again, you know, if you can reserve a core and you've got something CPU specific, that might make sense. Um, threads actually are a good example there of something which we actually have a pretty good way of keeping, you know, CPU context safe. So um, we can do a bit of that with CPUs, I think.
So how, how much uh, has KUnit grown over the last year for test-wise? Like you guys are always slowly incrementing. It's a pretty steady linear growth. I'm afraid I didn't put the chart in the uh, presentation, um, but we're at almost uh, a thousand tests upstream now, um, and it's you know growing mostly linearly. Um, what are your big, biggest subsystems growth uh, in the last? DRM is probably the biggest subsystem growth. There's a really nice little spike in the graph where uh, where DRM first started picking up KUnit a, a lot. Um, but we're also seeing two or three tests, you know, starting to grow in a number of other subsystems. Um, and that's, you know, really one of the things we want to see is, you know, lots of subsystems starting to use it rather than everything constrained to one. But uh, yeah, I will call out DRM uh, particularly as, you know, not only are a lot of the new drivers uh, using KUnit, uh, there's some retrofitting into old drivers and they've got some uh, CI integration they're doing with uh, KTAP parsers and the like. Is there a way to see the test coverage of a specific file or subsystem? So there, there is. Um, there are a few different ways. Any, you know, there are several test coverage tools that work with the kernel, but you can also take advantage of UML and just use GCOV with it. Um, there's a horrifyingly broken way and a slightly less horrifyingly broken way. Um, if you're using GCC, this is broken. If your version of GCC is newer than six, which is sufficiently ancient that everyone's wincing, um, uh, but you you know you can use it if you've got the old compiler lying around. Uh, we've also just discovered it works fine with Clang, even with newer versions. So if you're building the kernel with LLVM, the GCOV stuff just works. Um, if you're building it with GCC, you'll hit some issues with. Uh, constructors and, and changes in the GCC GCOV implementation, which we've, alas, not yet been able to fix. But, uh, um, you know, it's possible to do. You can look at coverage, you know, get fancy HTML charts and the like. Thank you, David. I think we'll switch to Philip now. Thanks. OK. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, you know, do come up to me and, and chat about it afterwards. Thanks.